I hope this is working. Yep. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. And what's going to happen is that I'm going to read just a few short passages um, from my book, and then we're opening it up to questions of any sort. Um, so hopefully in the area of learning disabilities, because I'm not sure I know anything else. But um, so that's the way it's going to work. And all questions are welcome. So this is from the introduction to the book, and it gives you an idea of why I wrote this book in the first place. We live in the midst of an educational tragedy. Schools are failing to identify and treat many children with dyslexia and other learning disabilities. There is a battle among parents, teachers, educational bureaucrats, and related professionals with children caught in the crossfire. There are no guns, tanks, and explosives in this conflict. The weapons in this struggle are complicated laws, requirements for extensive testing to identify a learning disability, destruction of students' self-esteem, belittlement of parents' and teachers' concerns, inadequate teacher training, blaming academic failure on behavioral problems, and erecting senseless barriers to reform. The result is tragic. Many children who struggle with learning become nameless, faceless ghosts haunting our schools and later are jails and mental institutions or living dangerous and aimless lives as homeless people on our streets. Some die at a young age from drug overdoses or suicide, the ultimate nightmare of parents. Children are not the only casualties. Adults also suffer from learning disabilities that were not recognized when they were in school and were never treated. Depression, anxiety, and deep feelings of inadequacy often pre prevent adults with learning disabilities from developing close relationships, finding rewarding employment, and living happy and produ productive lives. Many people with learning disabilities have also have special talents. Recognizing and nurturing the talents of all children go a long way towards overcoming the obstacles of learning disabilities. Agatha Christie, Winston Churchill, Pablo Picasso, William Butler Yeats, Susan Hampshire, and Greg Luganis all suffered from learning disabilities, yet became very successful. We can learn from their stories how to support children with learning disabilities by focusing on their strengths rather than just their disabilities. Solving the problem of learning disabilities is within our grasp, but it will take dedication and a desire to succeed. This book aims to provide strategies and ammunition for the battle. I invite you, the reader, to join me on this journey. What I'd like to do now is to read some of the descriptions of what it's like to have a learning disability, and this is um, through the eyes of children. They were encouraged by their teacher um, to write, they learned about metaphors and to write um, a metaphor for what uh, reading and dyslexia is like. Reading is a goose flying. A goose doesn't usually fly, but when other birds fly, the goose has to follow. The birds go to a higher level than the, than the goose, and the goose must try to follow, but it will be slower. Another child wrote, dyslexia is a crawling snail because you need time to get used to it, and you need time to get to the place you want. And you have to sit there and study more time than the others. You need to work harder and faster. For another child, dyslexia is a face that is stressed and scared. For another, it is a broken toilet bowl. Everything leaks out. If someone comes to your house and sees a broken toilet bowl, what would they think of you? This guy has no money. People don't like you. And there are many others. And you can really see um, what's happening to the children. Um, 
So many of society's problems, serious problems, including antisocial behavior, homelessness, and suicide, can be reduced if we identify learning disabilities and provide appropriate help to people who have them. Lives are wasted, even ruined, by not developing the skills and talents of people with learning disabilities. Solving the puzzle of learning disabilities will not cure all the evils in the world, but it would be a giant step forward. So one of the reasons that I wrote this book is because I did some okay, <laughs> some, uh, I did some research when I lived in Toronto among the homeless young people who live on the streets. And I found that 82% of them had learning disabilities that were not properly identified and treated. Uh, I also, with a student, Hazel McBride, we studied all of the adolescent suicides in a three-year period in Ontario. And in every one of those cases, there was evidence that there was a learning disability that not, had not been identified and treated. We know now how to discover children at risk, young children, kindergarten, grade one, for reading difficulties, and we know how to treat it. So we really have no excuse uh, for not doing something about it. Also, uh, as I mentioned, the assessment of learning disabilities has become very complex and expensive. And there is a two-year wait in most of the school systems, not just here, but in many places in the world because of this complicated system. And in fact, it can be done much more quickly and much more easily by teachers and school personnel um, who um, it doesn't require much training uh, and we could find these learning disabilities much more easily. So uh, it is, I think, one of the most serious problems in our society and it is partially responsible for the inequities that we have, especially the economic inequities, and uh, we can do something about it. So now I'd like to open the floor up to questions, discussion, whatever. Yes. I recently hired a, a, a live technician, and uh, during the course of the interview, we, we were talking about programming, and, and we I talked about this program, and she said, wow, that was amazing because she had a learning disability, and it was her own process that enabled her to get through high school and then later through the library tech course um, at uh, Langara. So what kind of processes would people use to help themselves overcome that particular challenge? And uh, that's a, a very good illustration. I think that particular individual was very talented, probably, and you said uh, in uh, technology, technical aspects, and we find that many people, especially with dyslexia, have real strengths in that area. But it doesn't usually happen that they're able to do it by themselves because what they experience in school is uh, really um, a fall in self-esteem and teachers well-meaning but don't really understand and will Probably her spelling wasn't very good and her punctuation wasn't very good and she couldn't read very quickly, uh, except technical manuals. Um, so uh, she was able to overcome that. Now what she may have done, which uh, I have a, a student now who's a, a doctoral student, uh, very severe dyslexia. She went to uh, undergraduate um, had an undergraduate major in computer sciences, but she learned to advocate for herself. And this particular person that you talk about may have done this. So she would go uh, in the beginning of all of her classes and say, 
I have dyslexia, I need more time for examinations, um, I need to do any kind of writing on a word processor because my handwriting is very messy and my spelling is terrible and no matter how hard I try, I can't do spelling. Um, and, uh, but she learned to say that. Now, it, uh, it's a little harder when you get into a job situation. Are you going to tell an employer that you have <coughs> dyslexia because probably there are several other people waiting in line for the job who may have dyslexia, but they're not going to say anything about it? Uh, so um, that's an issue. But at the cell, uh, probably, my guess is she did a lot of self-advocacy and also um, really found what her strengths are and as much as possible took the technical courses rather than you know, writing or English literature. Um, so uh, there, I think there are some people who can help themselves, but most of them really need a lot of help and understanding. Yes. Okay, I have two questions. Um, is there a particular reading program that you would recommend for students with dyslexia? And secondly, for, for those of us who are in the education system, and we've got a pretty good idea that the student has a learning disability, but they're not going to get diagnosed for who knows how long. What advice do you have for, for us? Okay, um, for the first um, question, reading programs. Uh, it depends on the age and the experience of the student. Uh, the, there are programs called multi-sensory programs like Orton Gillingham, Linda Mood Bell, the Wilson program, and those are individualized programs for students with dyslexia and serious dyslexia, and those are very good. Now, there's a little bit of a problem in that they're fairly expensive and you have to have a trained person to do it. So the, the solution, not for the ones who have it now, but in the future, what should we do? We know how to identify children at risk when they're in kindergarten and grade one for reading problems. And so there are interventions that you can do. Many of them are classroom uh, for the whole class. And uh, North Vancouver does that, and I've done some research, and very successful. So they have a program, for example, called Firm Foundations, which teaches the beginning reading skills. And then they have another one called Reading 44, which works on reading strategies. So if we did this in the class, this is not going to cure all the dyslexia, but it will help. Uh, for older children, well, even you can do this in grade one to about grade three. There's a program called Abracadabra, which is uh, developed by Concordia University, and it's free. It gets put on a school server. You, can't, uh, you can see a tri uh, demonstration on the internet called Abralite, A-B-R-A-L-I-T-E, and it basically it looks like a computer, computer games, but it's not. It's really activities um, to do uh, to help the child learn basic skills. And then there's a program after that, also free, um, called ePearl, and that helps develop writing skills and reading comprehension skills. So, um, but the key, the real key, is good classroom instruction. And in many places, my faculty included, but not just in my faculty, um, teachers, education students are not adequately prepared. Um, I uh, taught one class in the two-year B.Ed. program, so uh, this is a program post-B.A. Uh, um, where they have two years of teacher training. And it was after 18 months in the program, none of them knew what dyslexia was, except one Orton Gillingham, one uh, a student who had gone through the Orton Gillingham program. Uh, none of knew, them knew what phonics was or phonological processing, and this is two years ago. So um, we really have a problem in teacher education. 
Uh, and some of us are trying to solve it, but it's a struggle. Um, now, in regard to the assessment, uh, in fact, and I had just today, I had a good discussion with some people in the Vancouver School Board, and they're um, going to do this. Uh, the assessment, um, the traditional assessment, includes the IQ test. Um, I and other people, and there's a lot of information in the book about this, have evidence that the IQ is completely unnecessary, that we waste our time and money doing the IQ test. And as you know, psychologists um, are the only people who can do IQ tests. Uh, I got this idea because I'm a, a trained psychologist, and when I started in this field, I did a lot of IQ tests. And then I had to talk to parents and teachers, and I could talk about the reading and the spelling and the mathematics and the writing, but after an hour and a half giving the IQ test, I didn't think there was any useful information in it. So um, there, we really don't need it. And the other kinds of assessments, reading, spelling, writing, and mathematics, can easily be done by teachers, uh, teachers and um, other school personnel. So. Um, uh, some schools in the Vancouver School District are going to try this, and it will, um, it will at least tell the teachers what the students need. Now, will it count as an official designation? Uh, I have had some success with the ministry in um, doing this kind of assessment without the IQ and convincing them that um, this child really, or adult or whoever, really does have a learning disability um, because of poor performance in reading or, and or spelling and mathematics and writing, whatever their particular uh, area is. So there are other ways to do this assessment and get students identified. Um, and it's a matter of, first of all, convincing the ministry and then convincing school districts to use this kind of assessment. And um, I will uh, personally, I go to the ministry. I have done this with cases where I've assessed uh, both children and adults because the Ministry of Advanced Skills and Training is even worse um, than the Ministry of Education because they absolutely require an IQ test. The Ministry of Education does not anymore. And I've said, look at this pattern. This is obviously someone who's struggling with reading or mathematics or spelling or writing. And uh, this is a learning disability. And I've usually been successful. Now, what are the barriers? The barriers are uh, some professionals who want to continue doing it the way. Now, um, to wait an, uh, a year and a half or two years before you get identified is ridiculous. It's really losing a lot of valuable time. And we know, and we've known for even centuries, that the young brain learns much more quickly in these areas than the older brain, especially language. I mean, that's the way it is. There are some things we gain wisdom and other things as adults, but these basic skills are really should be learned early. And they can be learned after this, but it's more of a struggle. So um, we should be helping these children now. Now many of them think that the children themselves, and um, you can see it in what they were writing, feel um, inadequate because they're struggling. They think it's their fault. Uh, they think that they're stupid, and other people think that they're lazy. And that's just everybody's brain is different. And uh, there are, we all have talents and problems in a variety of areas. So um, I think we've just gone down completely the wrong road with assessment. And it really, you really have to do something about it. And I'm trying. Um, and. Uh, I have colleagues in many different places in the world, and we're all trying, but it's a hard battle. I just 
like to make a comment on that. Um, I emailed you about a month ago or something. You know, that. I told you a little bit about my story. And just to um, emphasize what you said is so important because we had that same experience with our child. And because her IQ test came back low, the, uh, the psychologist that we actually had gone to pretty well kind of gave up on her and just said, you know, you shouldn't expect too much. I mean, I knew she had some learning disability and I knew she would have an intelligence problem because you know your own kid and your teachers know your kid. But it was really difficult to like get like wade through that situation and then have to sort of discredit the like, everything that we went through with that psychologist. So um, it, it kind of slowed down our whole process of getting help for her because we didn't have the right um, documentation that we could take back to the school and say, you know, she really needs help. Luckily, her teachers looked at his report and just went, this is ridiculous. And we had a second opinion by a second psychologist who said the reason why she scored low on the IQ test is because she couldn't test. Like she, her learning disability was such that we weren't going to get any results. So that, that's just like so important what you're saying. When I was, I started reading your book and I was going through that, I thought, ah, <laughs> I wish I would have had that, you know, 10 years ago. Now she's um, in high school. She is um, struggling like mad, but getting through it, um, she gets a lot of support. She has, uh, she takes an LSP block, so she gets support through there and she gets accommodation for her tests, etc. She made the honor roll last year in grade 10, which was just like stupefying. Couldn't believe that that was happening. Um, it really built up her ego. But what we're, what we're facing now is um, like moving towards grade 12 and the provincial exams. This is a little bit of a worry, especially because English is the provincial in grade 12. And uh, her grade 11 teacher was wondering maybe she should take the communications English instead of like the higher level. But my child is dead set against it. She wants to go with it, even though it's. But I don't know what to like how to help her through that. And that's where you can get um, an official designation. Uh, I don't. One of the things we recommend, for example, is that there are um, extra time for examinations. She has been, she did have another test in last year, so she does have the designation. It's just like the, within, like how school is, how things are taught, and how output is expected. It's sometimes still really frustrating to um, see see how the education system is. It's there is accommodation, but even so, like output and um, how things are taught in class is still problematic. Like teachers can create tests testing of information in so many different ways, but if they set it up um, in a way that really taxes that person's ability. Like they could, she could probably talk about it or she could. Well, what, what you're talking about is a uh, relatively new movement mm -hmm. in the educational field called universal design for learning. And what that means is that there are different ways of um, representing information. So some people do better hearing it, some people do better reading it, some people like the diagrams and pictures. Others find them difficult to read. Um, so urging educators to examine these different ways of presenting information. Then, what, then there's the other side, the output. Uh, we have, we recommend, um, for example, some students are very good at talking. 
um, in uh, I w worked in um, our B. Ed. program, and we had something called problem-based learning, and we gave oral examinations. Uh, in, it was especially good for the dyslexics, but it was good for all of them because um, they learned how to speak, to present their point of view, and uh, they were allowed to write notes and do that, but um, that's a, another, that's a way. Um, I had uh, tested one little boy, 11 years old, who had terrible writing problems and spelling problems. And uh, part of the test was we wanted to see his writing. So we gave him a picture, and he had to write a story about it. And the story that he wrote was four lines long, and every single word except the was misspelled. He was 11 years old, and, and um, no punctuation. No capital letters, no periods. Uh, and we then gave him a tape recorder. This was when there were tape recorders. Um, it was, uh, it wasn't even, it was more advanced than reel to reel, but you know, it was a while ago. Uh, so we gave it to him and we said, okay, tell us about this picture. Tell us a story. So he took, he told a story. It took three pages to t transcribe and he had an overall plot, subplots within it. And it was a picture of sort of a spaceship and little figures in the spaceship. Uh, and he made up uh, a Martian language during the course of telling the story. So he would have the characters in the story talking in the Martian language. Um, so obviously, he had very creative ideas. But if you use the traditional ways of assessing it, you would say, he doesn't have any ideas, his spelling is bad, um, he can't really talk. Um, and uh, so it's the idea of universal design for learning is to try and find alternative ways. Now, the story with the IQ, uh, I guess about once a week, I hear a variation of the story. My child got an IQ test. And there isn't enough of a difference between the IQ score and the reading or the arithmetic or whatever, um, so they won't designate him learning disability. Now, we have known for over 25 years that that is an invalid way to define a learning disability. Um, and over 25 years. So I think it was about two years ago the BC Ministry of Education took it out of uh, the requirements for, but you know that was it took 23 years for that to happen, and even then, um, the IQ test is still a requirement in terms of the school district. So um, it, it's just really completely useless. And you know sometimes I get really angry and I said we should burn all these IQ tests because what are they doing? Um, uh, if you, the IQ test is really highly verbal or requires memory, fine motor coordination, all of these can, are problems with people with learning disabilities. But I found people with learning disabilities who have very good musical skills, there's nothing on the IQ test that tests your musical skills or your visual spatial skills or your artistic skills. And um, so intelligence isn't what's measured on the IQ test. There are varieties of intelligence and a variety of strengths. And it, as long as we keep that IQ test, we're going to have this problem. It's going to be there. Parents obviously don't have a lot of choice in which psychologist assesses their child in the school system. But if they choose to seek out a private psychologist, how do they sift through um, that to know which ones are up to date with current practices? <coughs> and which one will do the old discrepancy, sorry, good mm -hmm. luck. And it's a good idea to talk to them about it first. Okay. I, I just saw a report today. Uh, it was written two or three years ago. And um, this report was all they did was the IQ test and one small reading test. They didn't do any test of math. They didn't do any test of spelling. 
They didn't do um, even a reading comprehension test. Uh, they didn't do a decoding test, which you obviously need to do. And uh, so I would talk to the psychologist beforehand. And so the, I would say, what tests, what achievement tests are you going to do? And what is your definition of a learning disability? Because the, there are, there's a lot of argument in the literature. What should be the exact definition? So the usual is um, if, and forget the, if they use the discrepancy, go someplace else. I'm just add a little bit to that. I, from my understanding, to get the Ministry of Education designation, psychologists have to use it. Um, some standardized tests in that. So I have two children with dyslexia at Fraser Academy. I've used three different psychologists for their psych ed testings privately because I came up from the public school system a couple of years ago. And um, so three different psychologists, they knew straight off what tests were required to meet, to get the uh, full assessment, which would lead to a designation. So I've never come across a psychologist yet who doesn't know what's required. And I'm uh, I, I found <laughs> yeah. I this is the I mean, uh, but um, not to sell the book but there's a chapter in this book about assessment it tells you what the kinds of assessment that you should get uh, except for the IQ which I don't believe in so but oh, the other achievement tests and it seems to me that if a child or adult is doing poorly compared to others on an achievement test, we should call that a learning disability. Now, if the child has severe um, uh, mental handicap of some sort, then we're not going to call that a learning disability, but that's not what we're talking about. Um, you know, it's, uh, if it's a child uh, with Down syndrome, um, that's another issue. But that's, this is not what we're talking about. And even a child, uh, I tested one 19-year-old who had an IQ of 53, and that was on two different tests. And that's way below the le level. <coughs> but her mother had taught her to read, and it gave her a reading test, and she could read it compre and comprehend at the grade 6 level. Now, this particular young woman was interested in rock music, and her mother bought her magazines about rock music and taught her to read because this is what she was interested in. And um, now, she's not going to go to university. She's not going to be reading Shakespeare, but she's functionally literate. Um, and uh, it didn't matter what the IQ was. Now, if she, oh, and she was at that point, after you were 18 in the school system that I was working in, after 18 you couldn't use the resources of the school system. So, but nobody even thought about working with her before this point. Yes, it would have been more of a struggle to teach her to read. But why should she be, not be denied that? Um, and if you're going to say there isn't enough money, there is enough money um, to do that. And you think about what it costs later on. With these kinds of reading skills and other life skills, she could be self reasonably self-sufficient. And that's much cheaper than any kind of custodial care. Um, so you put the money in the beginning, and uh, you get it. But um, uh, I, I think really finding out what um, the psychologist is going to do and hopefully being in a school system where they'll move away from this and they'll give the teachers the, um, the right, the expectation to do this achievement testing and you can learn so much from that achievement testing. What kind of spelling errors do children make? Um, what kind of math errors do they make? Do they reading? Do they not know the sounds of the vowels? Um, do they not really know how to separate words into syllables? Um, so 
there's so many questions you can ask by giving a good reading or reading mathematics, spelling, and writing tests. This will tell you so much about uh, a person and what you can do to help them. I don't know if you talk about it because I was late, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter is five, she just turned five, and I'm new at this, uh, about this dyslexia thing. The teacher, her preschool teacher says that she might have dyslexia, and they brought um, a public health nurse and everything, and she came to my house. And she says that pro there's, there's a possibility that she has something bad. But they say that I should wait for the assessment, that maybe we should give her a chance. But I don't know what to do. No. You know, like I think I'm not rich, right? But I don't care. If it costs me $3,000, I will find a way to get the $3,000. But the thing is, should I wait until she goes to kindergarten? Yeah, in, in kindergarten, I, for example, North Vancouver is one district that does very good screening. And they'll look at children who are, uh, children who are at risk. They don't label them with anything. They just say they're at risk. And they make sure that they get special help, even at five in kindergarten. And when they do that, I've studied the children who have gotten that and waited, studied them as far as grade seven, and most of them, with this help that they get, catch up. We still have 1.5% that don't catch up. Um, but we have 98.5% that do. So, and what languages does your daughter speak? Spanish and English. Okay. Now, we used to believe, or some people used to believe, that a child who had a language other than English or the minority language, uh, the majority language, um, was at a disadvantage. In fact, it's just the opposite, because this, we studied the children in North Vancouver who have English as a second language. And what we find is that if they get good instruction in English, not only do they catch up, but in many ways they do better than native speakers, because learning two languages in ways that we don't understand really helps your brain. Yes, and they can, they have what we call better executive functioning, so they can um, allocate their attention to different places. We found in, for example, in spelling, uh, the children who had English as a second language had higher scores in spelling than the native speakers. On some grammar tests, we found, especially children who have a Slavic language as a first language, we found on an English grammar test, they had higher scores than native English speakers. We found on something called phonological processing, where you have to um, uh, recognize the sounds in words, uh, and in one case, you know, so it would be, uh, say pink, say it without the p. So you have to be able to separate the, the word you hear into different sounds that the children who had English as a second language were better than native speakers, even if they had dyslexia. So, um, but you have to have good training in English, and sometimes that doesn't happen in the schools. It's beginning to happen. I know North Vancouver is really very much advanced in that, um, in that area. So, um, and please don't let them tell you that the problem is that she's speaking Spanish. Spanish is good for her um, and will really help her. Uh, for example, we found that children who had a romance language as a first language were better at hearing the sounds in words than children who were in English words than children who were native speakers. Now, that, um, that doesn't show up right away um, not in kindergarten and grade one, but it starts to show up in the later grades. So it, it's very important for you as much as possible to keep speaking Spanish to her. And she'll learn English at school or preschool. And uh, um, what often happens is that they, children get to a stage where they don't, they want to speak English, not their first language. 
and it's very difficult for parents. So if you can keep up speaking the first language, that's great. And then what happens is when the children are 12 or 13, they go through what we call an adolescent identity. And then they really want to speak this first language um, because it helps, it's the part of their identity. Uh, and um, sometimes the parents have given in and resorted to English and it, it's not too late, but they really are hampered. So don't let anyone tell you that it's the prop her problem is Spanish. It's not. She needs good instruction in English. And you can when she's, um, oh, December, January in, uh, in, grade, in kindergarten. They can do some assessment, and they should be doing not just of her, but all the children in her class. And you, you see what the children can do well and the difficulties that they have, and work on those, both the strengths and the difficulties. And that's what happens in North Vancouver, and it's very successful. But do you think I should wait for a, an I would assessment? Wait. I would, yeah, I would wait till she's five, in kindergarten. And give her a few months in kindergarten. Yes. I was wondering, in the school system, do you have to have an official designation before you can get the extra time to do tests or go to a separate room to do tests? Um, or they let you have that? Uh, districts vary a lot about that, but you don't need to have the official designation in many places to get the extra time. Um, some places are very rigid about that. and. Uh, they're, they're, when the whole idea of extra time was first introduced, um, there was a lot of opposition to it, that it's not fair. So what we did was a study, this one was with adults, um, where we gave them a reading comprehension test, multiple choice, and they had a fixed amount of time, whatever the test required, let's say 20 minutes. And then we gave them an alternate form and said, you can have as much time as you want. So what happened? The, the students who were dyslexic did much, much better when they had extra time. But the students who weren't dyslexic, many of them actually did worse when they had extra time. Because if you t look at multiple choice questions, you see there's different ways they could be approached and some of them are tricky. So. And we also saw that the dyslexics, when they had the extra, even when they didn't have the extra time, they answered most of the questions correctly, they just didn't answer very many. So they were thinking, they were comprehending, but it just took them more time. And um, this uh, was brought home to me. I had to take, a, I'm a licensed psychologist, and I had to take a multiple choice test. and. I finished it very quickly, and I said, I think we have four hours for it, and I finished it about two hours, and I said, well, this is ridiculous. I should go back and check my work. So what I did was go back and change, not knowing what I was doing, change some of my correct answers to the incorrect answer. So I ended up with a lower score, which is exactly what, you know, so I don't have dyslexia, I don't have a reading problem, and, um, extra time was not good for me. So I think this is true for many people. Um, who, who, so this argument that it isn't fair, so we should say, okay, you can have extra time, but you run the risk of ending up with a lower score. Uh, and it's always good for dyslexics to have extra time. I know that part of the problem is that she feels anxious about not getting it done on time. And so then that means that it just takes you that much longer. That's right. And then why not have extra time? And why not? Um, we see this in reading, but we also see it in math, mathematics, that people need time to think through. And why does it have to be a race? I mean, if you know it, 
you know it. We're not talking about taking three years to take a test. You know, it's an extra half hour, or two, even two hours. Um, it's not, if you can, if you, we really want to find out if you know it, not how fast you can do it. That's really not an issue most of the time. Yeah, yes. and also, I would say also sometimes a reader will really help because the child, by the time they finish reading the question and decoding every word, they have lost complete context of the whole sentence. But if they can have like their LSP teacher or a teacher's a assistant read the question to them, and they test in a, in a separate group too, um, if that's how they learn, they can get the understanding of the question immediately and save so much time than figuring out what the question is. Sure, and you know, in a way, um, that's a more challenging skill because you have to, re yeah. you can't see it in front of you, you have to remember. So some people, that's a better way to do the assessment. Yeah, I have to agree with that because I've read my daughter novels mm -hmm. and for novel studies, I'm reading them to her and every week we have to read so many chapters. I'm the one who can't remember what happened last week. She remembers it all. I'm the one that's actually reading it now. No, uh, well, <laughs> uh, well, people tell me, you know, when we sometimes have them read a passage out loud and then answer questions, and so many people say to me, I can't read and remember at the same time. You know, it just uses too much brain space to do that. Um, so, and, you know, now we have... Uh, screen readers that will read what's on the screen. Um, we have uh, books and textbooks on tape, um, which are very useful. We allow students to tape record their lectures so they can listen and then play it back and hear it. Um, and uh, rather than taking notes, because many of them really have trouble taking notes. So there's all kinds of ways to do it. I'm dyslexic, and I found just, it's, you can picture the words in your brain, and it just sort of soaks in. When you hear it, or when you hear it, or I need to hear it and see it, but most of the time I'll close my eyes, and I can picture the scene. Yeah, and, and that's um, quite a different skill than most of us um, who, if we had to try and picture it, we, it, it wouldn't work very well. Um, and so that's a strength that dyslexics have, but we don't make use of it in the school system. Sorry, I'm asking so many questions. Um, sometimes uh, my daughter is so frustrated with like her inability to like read and decode and write essays, and she gets really worked up about it. And I, would you recommend like? I'd like to find her like a psychologist or a counselor who she could talk to, but who really gets that. And I don't want to make the mistake of picking a wrong psychologist again who doesn't get that. Um, what do you think about that? I think that would, how old is she? She's 16. Yeah, that would be very useful. But the other thing that would be very useful, um, what are her strengths? Music, art. Music, art, dance, performance. All, all artistic things. Okay. Yoga. Well, for she, she, I thought Yeah, they actually, in her school for PE, they yeah, have yeah, yoga. I so she takes yoga. Yes. So all of those things, those are her strengths. And encourage her to do that as much as possible. And encourage the school, you know, if, if they have performances, you know, she can be part of the performance. Yeah. Um, and dancing. Um, it's all those extra things too. But then, then she has to work really, really hard. On yes. It. Yeah. Just getting through so you know socials and English and biology. It's such a grind. <laughs> that part's such a grind. And, and something like biology involves a lot of memory, especially the way they teach it. It doesn't have to be that way. I know. It's but not, they don't teach it in a very. You know teach it in a very experiential way, I find. It's very text-based and then learning, you know, long Latin words. Yeah, we're um, working on some curriculum to teach uh, the basic science involved in climate change and global warming 
to grade four students, but using a lot of activities rather than memorizing things. Connectivity in the world, uh, smartphones, um, different social media. But uh, I mean, because children now are going to be, you know, raised with that. And do you see any effect that this might have on either our perception of learning disability or our actual uh, in integration of, of uh, methodologies? Yeah, I think that um, there's a, a very positive side to it. And that's uh, this presenting of information in different ways. And I think that's particularly good for dyslexics, but maybe for, for all people. So that's the positive side. The negative side is that real, it really does become addictive. And there has to be some, in the case of children, parental control that, you know, you have to do your, um, your hockey or your, uh, your dancing lesson or whatever it is and um, it limit the amount of time in the media. It's very tempting. Uh, it's, uh, but but not only for your children, but for yourself. You know, it's, I teach at UBC. So people come into class with their iPhone or their Blackberry or whatever it is, and they think that you can't see them doing it. So I said that, you know, we used to say teachers have eyes in the back of their head whenever they wrote on the blackboard. And I tell them teachers have eyes in the front of their heads also. And we can see when you're doing this. And the same thing, they bring the computers in. How could you say no to the computer? Um, but in fact, they're doing their email, not listening to what's going on. So I have some colleagues, not at UBC, but we talk about this in many places. Just they refuse to let any electronic um, device no computers, no iPhones, you know, no iPads, nothing. Uh, it's not very popular, but I think it might be the only way to go about things. And you can say, well, what about the dyslexics? Well, we, al we would allow the dyslexics to tape record. Um, I think that, again, the issue is control. Um, the good things, great. Um, now, we also have uh, Google, Wikipedia, all of these. Uh, so it's quite common if you say, OK, find out about uh, famous people with learning disabilities. So the students will go um, to the internet and find out. And there's a lot of misinformation on the internet. Uh, so we, and we're really learning that we have to be doing this. We haven't exactly found the good ways to do it, but to learn to evaluate the information on the internet. Where does it come from? Um, is there any validity uh, to it? Um, you know, I uh, had one student who came to me and found on the internet that Agatha Christie had dyslexia. She did not. She did have a learning disability, but it wasn't dyslexia. Um, so I said, where did this come from? Well, from a bunch of sites that say these are the famous people who had dyslexia. Um, you'll very frequently see Einstein list on this. He certainly did not have dyslexia. Um, and people say, oh, he wasn't good in math. Yes, he was very good in math. And he did very well in school. Um, and no evidence of dyslexia, but this is like a myth. That's get, that gets, has gotten started. So it's really important um, to uh, teach 
young people how to evaluate what's on the internet. Is this good stuff? No, and there's very inaccurate stuff, and so we really have to work on that. May I ask one more question? Sure. I hope it's okay to ask. If sure. You can just say. Um, apart from North Vancouver, what districts would you say are the most proactive in early screening and also, maybe more importantly, just the interventions? I wish I could say, I wish the answer to this question were different, but none. Uh, except for Powell River is moving along. Uh, they have very good administrators, and they're um, doing trials of um, abrac abracadabra in a program called Jump Math, and they're very uh, dedicated and interested. Um, there's a big resistance uh, in all of the other districts to doing this. Uh, North Van was a very lucky accident. They had a very good super, uh, no, uh, yeah, superintendent of, uh, of schools and all, uh, of the district and a very good uh, special education um, consultant. And they also had two very good school psychologists, um, Lorna Bennett and Pam Motley, uh, who happened to be there. And they knew all about the importance of this early screening and early intervention. And they developed, along with the teachers, this firm foundations. Um, so it was, uh, that was what was lucky about North Vancouver. And, you know, the year that we, we did our, we followed one group for a year, and when they, they got to grade four, uh, the children in North Vancouver, before that, in the um, FSA, the provincial exams at grade four, in reading, North Vancouver had been about in the middle. So there were, there were uh, 59 school districts in uh, British Columbia at that time, and they were about 30. So when we started, the, after we started this program, they moved to number two. And the one that beat them is West Vancouver, which has the highest per capita income of any school district in Canada. So I think that they're, and they have a significant, uh, North Vancouver has a 20%, now 30% ESL, a significant First Nations group, and they were doing very well. So why haven't the other districts done it? Well, there are some philosophies of teaching reading where you don't do this direct instruction. You don't teach children the sounds of the letters. Um, you just tell them to read and guess at the words they don't know. And you don't teach them any strategies for words that you don't know. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating. Why do they have this philosophy? I don't know. Um, I think it's totally ridiculous. Now, English, you can't always pronounce the word um, from the way it's, but you learn the strategy of some words you just have to remember. Um, but English is not so terrible, and you can sound out many words. And uh, the it was a, something called the whole language, popular philosophy, started in the 70s. In, mo, in many places in the world, it's on its way out. In British Columbia, it's not. <laughs> and to give you an example, some of you may have heard of the superintendent of reading. Um, superintendent of reading, about a year and a half ago, was given... Um, $10.7 million from the province to do, to help children with reading. The superintendent of reading does not believe in dyslexia or phonics or phonological processing. Um, and so they, they're spending this money, giving it to teachers for release time to reflect on how they teach reading. So if they ever tell you that there isn't enough money for these children who need help, what about the 10.7 million? They set up a committee, 
and there was nobody who was an expert in reading on the committee. Um, and so I volunteered to be on the committee. Needless to say, they weren't interested. Um, so and when I, I wrote them, I showed them the research I'd done on firm foundations and reading 44 and the literature that supports this uh, and how successful North Vancouver was, not interested at all. They have nobody from North Vancouver um, and they have uh, they certainly don't have me, and I didn't want any money for it or anything like that. So that's the, the, the state. Now, uh, Vancouver, because I just had a good discussion with them today, is that they're coming around, at least some of the schools are. So it's going to be better in Vancouver. Uh, and I've had a good discussion with some of the people in Surrey, so I think Surrey might be better. Um, Burnaby uh, and Coquitlam, not interested. Um, and Richmond, I have to say, hasn't been very interested, but maybe they'll change their mind. Okay. Part of the North Vancouver thing was too that they were sued by a parent because they couldn't teach their son to read. But what can we do? Because my brother was dyslexic, my son has dyscalculia, my niece has dyslexia. I'm getting too old to OJ to the <laughs> and they're not born yet, so I'm really be old by the time I ever get any. What can we do so that my children don't have I, and my children don't have to go again through what I went through getting my son educated? Okay, and it's getting together as parents and teachers um, and talking to the school district and saying, for example, why aren't you doing early screening? And they'll say, Oh, we are. Okay, what kind of early screening? Do you have any evidence for the validity of what you're doing? Um, what are you doing to help children? What are they going to say? We have to wait till they're identified. No, you don't. North Vancouver didn't wait. They started right away. Um, oh, we don't have money. Well, what about the 10.7 million um, that was given to the superintendent of reading? Um, and uh, you know, how much does it cost to do one of these assessments, even in school? I'm not talking about going to a private. Well, it, I calculated it probably costs over a thousand dollars by the time you figure the time, the writing up, um, the well, even more than that, fifteen hundred organizing the meeting. So you take that fifteen hundred, you put it in early identification intervention, and uh, you save yourself a lot of money later on. Um, and you just have to keep keep after them. I'm available to help anybody that wants. I'll give you all the information. Uh, I'll help you um, write the the brief that you need to do. You appear before them, and you have to ask these questions. And uh, certainly, um, it's possible. It's 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 a struggle, um, but I am here to help you do this, even if you don't buy the book. No. <laughs> so. yeah, but it would be nice if you bought it. Right? <laughs>